Hello and welcome everyone to this second virtual symposium of Chem Biochem um, on metals in biology. My name is Ruben Rack and I'm the editor in chief of Chem Biochem. Um, I am and we from Chem Mystery Europe are extremely excited to host this virtual symposium today. Um, with me today will be Charlotte Gers Panther, deputy editor at the European Journal of Organic Chemistry. Um, she will support us today throughout the event and try to answer general questions uh, within the chat function that you find at the bottom right corner of your browser. Um, you can use the chat to communicate with each other, but you can also use it to raise questions during the talks to the speakers. Um, please start your questions with at Gilles, at Seth, or at, at Marie uh, to help us um, find and identify those questions more easily. Today's seminar is brought to you by Chemistry Europe, your European Chemical Society publisher, representing 16 chemical societies from 15 European chemical con uh, European countries, including over 75,000 chemists. Now, without further ado, let's move to the scientific part of today. I am very, very grateful to the three speakers um, of today's session, Gilles Gasser from Kimi Paris Tech, uh, Seth Cohn from UC San Diego, and Marie Hefern from UC Davis. Um, each presentation will take roughly about 20 minutes plus 10 minutes Q&A. And now let's hand over to the first speaker, Gilles Gasser. Um, Gilles did his PhD at the University of Neuchatel in the group of Professor Helen Stöckli Evans um, after a postdoctoral stay with Professor Leon Spikia at the Monash University in Melbourne. Gilles was awarded an Alexander von Humboldt Research Fellowship that he carried out in the group of Professor Niels Metzler-Nolte in Bochum. In 2010, he moved back to Switzerland to become an professor, uh, assistant professor at the University of Zurich and after five years moved to his current, and I'm also relatively sure his final um, position in Chemie Paris Tech, simply uh, because it's a very nice and historical place, and I think he just loves Paris. And let's be honest, uh, it's probably not the worst place to live in. Um, Gilles has won numerous prizes and awards, and his group's Current research interests cover a wide, wide range of topics within the inorganic chemical biology space and within medicinal inorganic chemistry, but probably focusing most on the use of metal complexes to modulate properties of biomolecules and within cells, and of course, photodynamic therapy. Gilles, we are very, very grateful to have you here today and are very much looking forward to your talk. The stream is yours. Thank you. I will try to have the slides on. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? All fine, Jill. All fine. Sorry, I was already muted. Okay, sorry. I'm not seeing my slide. Okay, I'm just gonna start and there we go. Can you see it, Jill? Yes, I can see them, but only on the left. I will, I will try to see if it's working. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Ruben. Thanks a lot to the organizer. It's really a great honor and pleasure to be here with you today to present our latest research that we have performed in Paris. Uh, it is really a fantastic opportunity to share knowledge to a maximum of people because uh, Ruben and his colleagues have done a fantastic job to organize this for, for free. What I want, uh, uh, I hope I can go to the next slide, yes. Uh, what I want today is really to talk to you about metal-based drugs. As you are probably aware, metal complexes are already playing a great job in medicine. They are used to treat or to image different diseases, uh, I like to emphasize, for example, that platinum complexes are used in more than 50% of every chemotherapeutic treatment in the world. But other metals, sometimes which are probably thought to be only toxic metals, are also used our day. I'm thinking of arsenic, which is used to treat certain types of leukemia, or mercury, which is used in vaccine as a preservative. This is really important to remember that metal complexes 
are very important in medicine and we have really to emphasize this point. A topic that I want to discuss today is photodynamic therapy. Photodynamic therapy is a medical technique which is approved, I will insist on the word approved, to treat certain types of disease. It relies on the use of a photosensitizer which is generally injected intravenously to the patient. Once in the patient, it can circulate in the blood and reach, after a certain time, the tumor. When it is in the tumor, the medical doctor will be able to apply some light to activate the photosensitizer. The photosensitizer will reach a triplet state and this triplet state will be able to react with triplet oxygen present in the tissues. This, uh, and this triplet oxygen, once it reacts with the photosensitizer, will produce singlet oxygen, which is an extremely reactive uh, species, which will oxidize everything around and finally lead to cell death. It is already approved to treat certain types of cancer, but also bacterial and fungal infection, for example. However, there are about 13, I think, photosensitizers which are approved. There are still some problems, some drawbacks, because actually all of them are usually based on the same motif, phthalocyanin or porphyrins. And usually they are extremely poorly soluble they have only, uh, they have poorly soluble, they are extremely difficult to, to, to synthesize, to prepare, and they have also a low cancer cell selectivity. That is why it would be very interesting to make a new types of photosensitizer. And our group with other group, like I have mentioned on this slide, have suggested to use metal complexes. I would say the probably the best highlight in the field of coordination chemistry is without any doubt the compound of Cherry McFarland, the TLD1433, which is currently in phase two clinical trial to treat certain types of bladder cancer. This is really a fantastic uh, opportunity for the field to have such a compound. And I really like to emphasize that technically this compound is very easy to synthesize and it is very nice to see something so facile to prepare that can go to clinical trial. The introduction is finished and I want now to share about our work and I would like really to emphasize that Johannes Kargas, a former PhD student, has made all or nearly all the, the work in the lab. I would like also to take this opportunity to congratulate him because Maybe he just learned it, but he has been selected as one of the 45 uh, uh, competitors which have been selected for the REAXIS prize. I would like also to emphasize that Ui Chao, Professor Ui Chao from Sun Yat-sen University, has been a fantastic collaborator over the year on uh, this topic. This, uh, this project started by reading publication from others and we noticed a paper in 2007 that said that simple ruthenium polypyridyl complexes, if you were changing uh, the ligands, could start to absorb in the near the red or near the uh, uh, near IR just by subtly changing the, the ligands. And we were extremely interested and we have decided to investigate if we could do such complexes. I know that the complexes which are, uh, which is written on, on, on this slide have never been investigated, for example, in, uh, in PDT. So what we have done, we have teamed up with Dr. Ilaria Cioffini from Shimi Paritech, who is a specialist in uh, TD DFT. And we have asked her, we want to make compounds which will absorb in the red or in the near IR. What type of ligand would you do? And she made some calculation and finally we have selected seven compounds. The aim was really that we think before doing the synthesis in order to avoid to produce one million of compounds and finally only to find one which was of interest. 
So we have decided to make those seven compounds. And Johannes afterwards went to the lab and first of all succeeded in preparing the ligand very simply. That's very important if you want to make a compound, the synthesis should be simple. In one step synthesis, it could make the ligands. My colleagues in Zurich, uh, um, Olivier, could also uh, measure the, the crystal of all the, the ligands. It was fine. With this in hand, we could also make very easily the complex. You can see it's always two-step synthesis to obtain afterwards all the desired complexes. We have done all the analysis to prove that it was the right complexes. We have even X-ray data. And I also to like to emphasize that we have to check the purity that we have all the micro analysis. With this, we have decided now to look, is it possible to have indeed this compound which absorb in the, in, in the UV or even higher to in the red or near IR. And as you can see on this slide, I'm sorry, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not completely uh, sure that it is working. I hope that the slide is now the, the right one. You can see really that our compound are starting to absorb up to 700 nanometer for some of the complexes. That was exactly what we wanted. And you will see that the best compound that you see, for example, on this data, were not the best one in biology. And this is very important to emphasize this. We were very happy. And afterwards, we have decided to check that our compound were photostable. Because this is one of the important problems of some of the photosensitizer, which are already approved, which are on the market. When you shine light, after a while, they degrade. They are transformed into something else, which is not what you want. And you can really clearly see on this slide that our compounds are extremely photostable. And for example, as an example, we have taken protoporphyrin 9, which is an example of porphyrin, is really degraded over time. We have used exactly the same condition, same time. This is good. Now we can start, I will say, the biology. And I would like to remind you that our compounds are phosphorescent so that you can actually see where they are going into the cells. We have used different um, dye, commercial dyes, to see if there was a colocalization. And we could really see that our compound were going generally to the cytoplasm, not really to the mitochondria or lysosome, but generally to the cytoplasm. What is very important in the field of metals in biology is that our compounds are containing metals. And because they are containing metals, we can start to use analytical techniques which are only working when you have a metal. And that's why we are using very often ICPMS. And you can see that by extracting each organelle of the cells, we can look where the ruthenium is going. And you can see that most of the ruthenium is indeed in the cytoplasm, as we have seen also by confocal microscopy. We can really see that both analytical techniques are giving similar results. Now, what can we do next? We have to prove that our compound are indeed photoactive. To do this, we have given to cells you know, a dye, a diester dye. And this diester dye is given to the cells and because they are neutral, they can enter into the cells. Once they are into the cells, there are esterases which will cleave up the ester bonds so that you have afterwards two carboxylic acid. And if singlet oxygen is produced, the dye will become fluorescent. And this is what you should see on the video normally, that once you shine light, you see clearly that it's starting to be green in the cells. Very interestingly, it is exactly green in the cytoplasm, really showing that there is a correlation of the localization of our compound and where our production is made. We, we went further afterwards and we wanted to see that the cells are indeed dying once 
we are shining light if the compound is present. And you have an example here of cells which have received our compound. They are for the moment fine. They are not toxic. They, they are, the compound is not toxic, so the cells are, I would say, happy. And as soon as we shine light, normally you should see on the video that suddenly the cells are literally blasting. And this is very, very interesting because it shows actually that we are, first of all, killing cells. And also we could understand the mode of action, which was a mixture of apoptosis and paraptosis. The next, the next, um, the next thing that we have done, it was really to uh, check if our compound were penetrating into tumors. And for this, Johannes used MCTS, 3D multicellular tumor spheroids, in order to see if the compound were going through the wall uh, tumor. So he grow spheroids, it is the assembly of little of cells which can go up to nearly one millimeter. And you can see on this slide clearly, uh, normally there is again a video, but I don't know if it is working. You can really see that actually the compound is really going through the wall cell. You can see by one photon, but especially by two photon irradiation because we can use light up to 800 nanometer to irradiate our compound. And this is really a proof that the compound is going through the wall tumor and not stay only on the crust. We could also see that our compound upon light irradiation are killing these uh, spheroids. After three days, we start shining light and you see really a decrease in the volume, in the size of the spheroid, especially with one of the compounds. And you can see that this compound is not the one which was absorbing uh, the most at 700 nanometer. We were happy, now we wanted to go further to do some in vivo experiments. And to do this, we wanted first to decide on which types of cancer we wanted to target. And once we have injected the compound into mice, we have directly seen that for some reason, the compound like to go to, uh, the, to, to the colon. To the, to the intestine. And we thought maybe there was a preference for this type of, of cell of our compound. And that is why we have decided to use a model of uh, colon cancer, which is extremely nasty. Very honestly, this type of uh, colon cancer is resistant to all known uh, chemotherapeutic uh, treatment. And we have decided to grow this on the flank of uh, mice. We were, first of all, happy to see that the mice were not at all affected by your compound when they were kept in the dark. The, the weight of the mice was not changing over time, clearly showing that they are not suffering. We were also extremely... Oops, uh, uh, okay. uh, we were extremely happy to see that once we were shining light, one hour after having injected our compound, only once we were shining light, either with one photon or two photon, you clearly see on this graph that the tumor will absolutely uh, completely be removed, contrary if you were just irradiating with light or just giving the compound. The tumor was clearly growing. And you can see this much better on this figure. You can see on the left, it is the, uh, the mice treated with two photons. Afterwards, it's treated with one photon. And on the contrary, the size of the tumor that you get if you just give the light or the compound. So we were extremely happy with uh, this result. I would like really to emphasize that we have used intravenous injection, which is uh, extremely difficult. Usually uh, people are just injecting directly into the tumor, the compound, and it seems that it is not working that well when it is going to the clinic. Now, I just want to go a bit further, but as you can see on this slide, when you look at the biodistribution of the compound, you see that only a very little part of the compound is going to the tumor. Still, it was working, 
but we saw that we could do maybe better. What could we do in order to improve the, um, this, the selectivity of our compound to the tumor? And this is when we saw that encapsulation could be a solution. The idea is to use a polymer and to encapsulate the photosensitizer to form nanoparticles. This nanoparticle can be injected into the mice. And because of two effects, you could have a, a selective accumulation. The first of all is the enhanced permeability and retention effect. The fact that large molecules are accumulating better into tumors. And the fact that the polymer that we have used as a biotin and the biotin can be brought by a protein, which is called the sodium multivitamin transporter, into the cells. I know that we have used a polymer which can be, which is commercially available and which is already approved by the FDO, some related polymers. Johannes did the nanoparticle, he mixed both compounds and finally get very nice nanoparticle in size between 75 to 120 nanometer. We have used them also to show that the nanoparticle were, were, were absolutely fine. I also note here that the nanoparticle are stable for seven days, for example, in water, which is clearly showing that what we have done is stable. Once we look at the cellular localization, you can clearly see that the compound is going this time to the lysosomes. So the nanoparticles are going to the lysosome, which is not very surprising when you have nanoparticles. And once again, you can use as a microscopy or ICPMS. We were also extremely excited about uh, the result here which shows the selectivity of our compound towards cells which are overexpressing this protein, this sodium multivitamin transporter. What jo Johannes has done is to mix two types of cells. He has used a, a, a type of lung cancer, which is overexpressing this protein. And this cancer cell is also genetically modified to express EGFP. And we have used a human fibroblast, which is not overexpressing the protein. And as you can see, we have really an accumulation of our compound into the cells which are overexpressing this protein, exactly how we wanted. We have done also studies the uptake mechanism. We have used different inhibitors to prove that actually this sodium multivitamin transporter was responsible for the uptake of the compound and we could indeed demonstrate it. This. We have also again used spheroid as a model for a uh, tumor. And you can really see on this picture, I hope that you see well, but you see that using two photons, especially once again, the ruthenium complex can go through the whole mini tumor. And this is exactly what we wanted. Finally, last but not least, we have done again in vivo experiment at Sun Yat-sen University. And you can see on this slide that thanks to this encapsulation using the same amount of ruthenium, we could have a 8.7 times higher accumulation of the photosensitizer into the tumor thanks to this encapsulation. And you can also see that the effect upon two photon irradiation or one photon is also working, clearly showing that this encapsulation, which is simple, easy, allow actually having a higher selectivity towards cancer. I see that my time is soon up. I just want to conclude by saying that I strongly believe that metal complexes have a huge role to play as photosensitizer in PDT, but or more generally in medicine, even more than what they are uh, playing at the moment. I would like also to thank uh, all the people in Paris. Uh, oops, sorry. In Paris, uh, we have, I'm very lucky to have a very dedicated team. The people who were before in our group, the people we are collaborating with, and finally, all the people who are giving us money, uh, they are extremely generous. I'm extremely lucky to have them. I hope everything uh, was clear. Sorry for the little technical problem. Uh, the video uh, seems not to work on my computer, but I hope they were working for you. Thanks a lot.
Thank you very much, Jill, for this very, very, very interesting uh, presentation. And I think everything worked nicely, but I just had to click through the slides for you. Uh, I don't know oh, what okay. happened, but Thank I think, you. but it I think it came through nicely. I could hear you clicking on your computer. That gave me the trigger to uh, go over to the next slide. Anyway, um, we have a couple of questions, uh, a few interesting ones. I'm just gonna start with the first one by uh, Michal Shoshan. Uh, first of all, I have to already apologize if I mispronounce any of the names. I'm very sorry, I'll try my best. The question is, um, Jill, uh, thank you for a great talk. Um, DCF detects various types of reactive oxygen species. How do you know that this indicates the formation of singlet oxygen? Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, yes, it is right. So we have just look at ROS. We could have used, for example, EPR to be sure that it was singlet oxygen. And we have done it, actually. I just wanted to do it in the cells. Uh, outside the cells, you can use EPR to be sure that it is the right, uh, the right reactive oxidation species. You could also use uh, inhibitors in the cells. But E is right, and we are sure that it is singlet oxygen. Thank you very much, Jill. Uh, just a very brief question on your nato nanoparticle synthesis by Raji Subramaniam, um, basically asking how those nanoparticles were synthesized. Um, so technically, if he wants really all the details about, you know, the equivalent, he can really go on chem archives. Okay. This has been deposited two or three weeks ago on chem archives, but you dissolve the, the complex in a solvent. And afterwards, you add the, the polymer in another one. And there is afterwards ultrasonic bath for X minutes and you form nanoparticles. We did not use something special. It is really a well-known method here. Okay. Um, Jill, another follow-up question on the nanoparticles by Rachendiran um, Venugopal. Um, he was asking about the renal clearance of those complexes. Yeah, he, he is right. Uh, and if you look at the biodistribution of our compound, there were definitely some of the compound in the kidney, which is good because normally nanoparticles have more a tendency suddenly to more often to go to the liver. And you want actually renal clearance at the end. And it is so why we have decided to irradiate the nanoparticle quickly after injection. I think it's one hour. We had looked at different time points and we have seen that the earlier the better to have the more compound into the tumor. But he is right, this is an important uh, parameter. Thank you, Gilles. Um, another question from Konrad Kowalski. Hi, Konrad. Um, Hi, Gilles. Gilles, nice talk. Um, I would like to ask how the ruthenium compounds are taken up by the cells, passive diffusion maybe. Have you observed vesicle formation which are formed during the treatment of the cells with the compounds? Okay, so now we are going back, I will say, to the first project without the nanoparticle. In the nanoparticle, it was taken up, I don't want to say something wrong, but it was normally passive diffusion. That's why they were actually not a, a high selectivity between, uh, between to go to the tumor. And uh, that was the, what was the second question, sorry, the, of Conrad? Um, there was the second, question. Um, the second part was if you've observed vesicle formation during the treatment with the compounds. Uh, yeah, he is right. And actually, if you look at the video, there was, I don't know, you have seen the video? Yes, of, I did. Uh, yeah, did. Yes. You can really <laughs> see that there was actual vacuole forming. And this is really well known for paraptosis. And upon light irradiation, you have really vacuole. And we know that there is nothing in the vacuole because, first of all, we saw that they were filled with something and there is nothing inside. So it's a good question. Thanks, Cora. Thank you, Gilles. Um, another question from Manuela Raposo. Um, she is asking um, if you've tried ruthenium complexes bearing different thiophene ligands. Uh, no, <laughs> because uh, you should ask Sherry McFarland because she's <laughs> is a specialist with uh, thiophene ligands. And we, we haven't worked yet with thiophene ligands, to be honest. And uh, but it's it's working really 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 well because one of them uh, is in clinical trial. I would encourage to encourage her to look at the papers of Sherry because she has really attached different amount of thiophene to the ruthenium complexes, 
And I think she found out that three was the best. Thank you very much, Jill. Um, there is another question from uh, Fang Xin Wang. Um, uh, nice, nice work and nice talk. Um, I would like to know um, what you think of the future of two-photon photodynamic therapy because it might be difficult to achieve in clinical settings. Yeah, that's also a very, very good point. I did not have time to talk about it. But two-photon is very nice because you can go deeper into the skin, into the body, but you need a high precision laser, okay? Only the where the light is shines that you will have uh, an effect. I do believe that at the moment it is too early, but I really do hope that with technology and future, in the future, this could be starting to be useful for high precision, you know, PDT. You know, you can think that certain types of cancer, if you think about, for example, brain cancer, where you really do not want to reject too much brain, this could become suddenly handy, uh, especially when you think of um, a laser which is fixed and you start turning the patient in 3Ds. Uh, I often seeing this as an example, uh, we, we, we don't have to forget that what we thought was impossible in medicine uh, 20 years ago and now is routine. And I really hope that it will be exactly the case. There are huge progress uh, in this field. And I strongly believe that this could be the case. It is definitely interesting to, to, to look more into, into this. And I would like to emphasize that there are only maybe a half a dozen or a dozen of in vivo experiment with two photons. And normally they have been always very positive, which is good. And we definitely need more in order to fully understand the full potential of, of this technique. It, it is a, a really great question. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Thank Jill. Very much, um, Jill. Um, another another question, question on the biology, on the biology that came that up in the very beginning very by Mary Conkle. Um, you um, mentioned that the cells underwent both ferroptosis and apoptosis. Um, she was asking which, which method you use to access ferroptosis. Uh, actually, uh, it, it's a misunderstanding. It's paraptosis. It's not ferroptosis. And uh, paraptosis, you, you, you can uh, use uh, different uh, inhibitors. Uh, we have shown this with my colleague Stefano Ferrari uh, a few years ago that it was one of the mechanism of action. And uh, yeah, so I suppose the question was because she was interested in ferroptosis, but it's paraptosis. It is quite uh, rare, but there are more and more uh, paper about PDT, which shows that paraptosis is one of the mechanism of cell death. Okay, thank you, Jill. Um, another question by Sergio Celis. Um, he would like to know about generally the cell permeability of ruthenium complexes if they do need a carrier for cell penetration and if you do observe uh, side effects during the excitation of those complexes because similar complexes are used in proximity driven labeling of proteins by creating amino acid radicals. So technically the compounds are going normally through the cells, you know, no, normally, I, I will say, because we can do confocal microscopy or ICPMS. Are they toxic um, in the dark? The aim is normally that they are not toxic in the dark and only upon light irradiation are toxic. But uh, I, I cannot remember the name of, of the person who has a question, but... Sergio. Sergio. So he is right when... Uh, he says that they can be toxic because all the compound, similar compound, have been found to be toxic in the dark and they are really used also as anti-cancer agent. It really depends on the localization, where they, where they are going, how much they are going to this lo localization. So th there is no rule. No one can predict if a compound at the moment will be toxic or not with the ruthenium polyperidyl complexes. And for the labeling of proteins, it is in also interesting to, it is interesting, this question, because he, this person has really to look by its, by, us, by himself if the lab, if the labeling is bringing toxicity to the cell. Uh, no one, very honestly, can say at the moment if it will be or not the case. With fluorescein, normally we know that it won't be the case, but 
with, with ritanium complexes, it will really be on, on case by case. Thank you very much, Jill. Uh, I think in the interest of time, we have to move on. And I really want to like thank you, thank you for your talk and also the very, very lively interaction. I think overall, we've received roughly 20 questions throughout the chat. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Uh, Jill, I'm happy. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure Jill is happy to go back to the chat and answer as many questions as he can. Now, okay. uh, I don't know if you can hear me, but I can't hear you anymore, Ruben. Uh, Seth, uh, same for me. I cannot hear him. Okay. Thanks for confirming. Okay. Just wait a few sec. Sorry for, the, for this. I think there was just a short interruption. Um, we're back on. Seth, can I can can you just say something? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay? Oh, nice. Very nice. So maybe that problem was on my side. I'm very sorry for that short interruption. Um, yeah, I was uh, just about to finish talking about your various topics, and I'm I'm pretty sure you're gonna you're gonna present something very nice today. And without further ado, because I've lost enough time now, um, Seth, Seth, the stream is yours. Okay, thank you. Let me see the slide. Okay, yeah, so uh, I want to thank uh, Ruben and his colleagues as well for uh, inviting me to participate in this online symposium today. It's a, it's a real pleasure, and I appreciate everybody who's who's come online. Um, I also uh, want to thank uh, Gilles for a nice uh, talk. It's great to be in his company and Marie's company today. Um, and uh, uh, Gilles' uh, student, uh, Johannes, that uh, did a lot of the work he presented that he uh, uh, mentioned is a postdoc in my lab now, so I also want to congratulate Johannes on his uh, Reaxis award. That's uh, uh, terrific. I'm very excited to hear that. So um, again, uh, happy to be part of this uh, virtual symposium, and I want to spend some time today telling you about a very uh, concise topic because we have limited time. I'm gonna, just going to give you a very um, short story on uh, a little slice of some of our work on metalloenzyme inhibitors, which has uh, been an area of interest in my lab for almost 20 years now. Um, so the title of my talk you see here is the development of metal, ba metal binding isosteres for fragment-based drug discovery. And so here I just need to um, put a little qualifier in that this presentation is a, a review of results from my laboratory at UC San Diego. And I'm presenting this uh, talk today on behalf of a representative of UC San Diego and just my lab and no other organization. So first, I just want to give you a very brief background on um, metalloenzyme inhibitors and why they are of interest. So again, this is a topic that my lab has been interested in for uh, since the beginning of my career in 2001, my independent career. So um, this audience, at least many people I'm sure in this audience know that metals are highly relevant to biological systems, and this includes a number primarily of first row transition metals as shown listed here. Uh, all um, organisms basically require metal ions for life. That includes higher organisms like humans, but also bacteria and viruses uh, require metalloenzymes, inclu including the current COVID um, uh, virus that's, that's uh, creating the pandemic. Um, metalloenzymes are involved in a wide variety, of course, of biological processes, including peptide degradation, epigenetic modification, antibiotic resistance, um, and many others. So here's where the interesting part comes in, at least for my lab and myself, is that although approximately a third of all enzymes, probably even a little more, um, are metal dependent or contain a metal, 
Um, only 5% of FDA, US uh, FDA approved drugs uh, target a metalloenzyme. So to me, I see a big disparity there. You have uh, uh, vir a th virtually a third or a lot more of all metalloenzymes of potential target space for treating disease um, being metal dependent, and yet uh, less than 5% of drugs target enzymes that have this cofactor. And so the question becomes, why is there this disconnect between the two? Um, I will say that um, it's not because metalloenzymes are poor targets. Uh, small molecule, uh, classic drug-like molecules of metalloenzymes um, have, been, have been developed. Again, it's a small percentage, and they're used to treat a wide range of diseases very successfully, including the ones listed at the bottom of the slide, hypertension, cancer, glaucoma, uh, HIV, AIDS has been a very successful area for metalloenzyme inhibition development, and even influenza. So several viral diseases, again, pertinent to current events listed there. Matter of fact, uh, as a little side note, as a somewhat a side note, the the uh, receptor that the COVID virus binds to, uh, ACE, uh, angiotensin converting enzyme two, uh, is a zinc dependent metalloenzyme. Um, so here, actually, we're going to talk about some ACE inhibitors to contextualize uh, why we think a new chemistry needed to be brought to bear on this problem uh, many years ago now. So here we have actually four angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors listed. Um, you see their chemical structures and highlighted in red on each of these chemical structures is the part of the molecule that binds to the zinc ion in ACE. And you can, so you can see we have thiols, carboxylic acids, phosphonates, and on the right, a hydroxamic acid. Um, these are functional groups that bind the metal. Um, you can call them different things. My group has chosen to, chosen to call them metal binding pharmacophores, or MBPs for short, uh, representing the fact that they are pharmacophore, they're a pharma, uh, pharmacologically active part of the molecule, and their role is to bind a metal ion. And so you can see a, a small variety even within this class of inhibitors that are uh, designated for just this one metalloenzyme. But importantly, um, the hydroxamic acid on the right has for many, many decades dominated the metalloenzyme inhibition literature, and not just for ACE, but for metalloenzyme inhibitors in general. That is, when one wants to design a small molecule to um, inhibit a metalloenzyme, you might do classic sort of drug development, metalloenzyme drug development, but at the end, uh, a hydroxamic, hydroxamic acid would be added to bind the metal ion, almost as an afterthought. And interestingly, hydroxamic acids in particular don't make very good drugs. They have a lot of pharmacokinetic problems and pharmacological problems, um, such that it's, it's well represented on this slide of the four ACE inhibitors I show here. Uh, ACE is, uh, by the way, inhibited to treat hypertension, so high blood pressure. Um, all of them are approved except for the hydroxamic acid, even though, again, that functional group tends to dominate the metalloenzyme field. This next slide is just another example of how the hydroxamic acid group has uh, overwhelmed or in many ways dominated the chemistry of metalloenzyme inhibitors. And so what you see here are a series of inhibitors over time from 1996 to 2012, and I actually could and should update this further to present day, um, where this is a, these are inhibitors developed against a target uh, called LPXC that's shown in the red arrow. LPXC is an antibacterial target, so it's important um, for uh, gram-negative bacterial uh, metabolism, and it's a zinc-dependent enzyme. And you can see over the course of, actually, if I were to extend this arrow out to make it current, over 20 years, although the molecules, the inhibitors that have been developed to uh, target this enzyme have evolved to create a new antibiotic, the hydroxamic acid MBP has been unchanged for a 20-year research period. And to me and my group, that seems very odd why you would do all this medicinal chemistry to uh, target these metalloenzymes and not explore the chemistry around the MBP, especially since I just showed you two totally different enzymes. They both have zinc active sites, but one's uh, an, in bacteria, the other one's in humans uh, for totally different diseases, and yet you're using the exact same functional group in both cases. And um, so you see a quote there, which might have represented hopefully in the past, maybe not in the future, the attitude of some uh, large pharma companies around this issue. Um, and so the question my lab started with 20 years ago was, how do we move beyond these hydroxamic acids? As a trained inorganic bioinorganic chemist, I can think of lots of functional groups to use aside from a hydroxamate to, um, to target a metalloenzyme active site. So, 
Um, that's sort of the context of why we were interested in this problem. Metelloenzymes are under-targeted as a class of potential therapeutics, or therapeutic targets rather, and the chemistry around the development of metelloenzyme inhibitors was relatively limited at the time we started. Um, so then let me give you now sort of a second background about what my group is focused on, and then we'll move into some new results uh, that will be the, the heart of the talk. And again, it's just gonna be a small sliver of what we do uh, focusing on some recent results. So we um, sort of unknowingly decided to pursue fragment-based drug discovery as an approach to, to addressing the metalloenzyme inhibition problem. And I say unknowingly because I started my independent career as an inorganic, bioinorganic chemist, and had to learn over time sort of self-taught medicinal chemistry um, to the point now where I think my lab and I are, are uh, can conservatively say that we are semi-card-carrying medicinal chemists. Uh, we've been commented on in Derek Lowy's blog uh, in the pipeline, so I think that gives us credibility. So for those of you that aren't familiar with fragment-based drug discovery, it's a, uh, an approach to drug discovery that uh, deviates a bit from traditional high-throughput screening. So um, uh, a large amount of small molecule drug discovery has been done through high-throughput screening, where basically you have huge libraries of drug-like or natural product-like compounds. These are usually in the hundreds of thousands, if not millions, especially if you're talking about the libraries available at pharmaceutical companies. Um, these, again, are larger compounds. They're more drug-like. And these will get screened once an assay is developed against a target of interest. These will get screened. Um, and uh, you'll identify an initial hit, and then you'll do medicinal chemistry or development around that hit. And that's shown in the, in the image in the upper left. And so the idea is that you'll get a sort of drug-like lead to begin with, and you'll modify it to, to get a, a, a more optimized compound. Um, these molecules uh, can have pretty good affinities to start with, um, and then you can improve from there. But one thing to notice is that because these molecules are trying to interact with multiple pockets at the same time, you might not actually get any one interaction to be optimal at a given time when you start from a, from a relatively large molecule to begin with. So um, fragment-based drug discovery uh, developed primarily in the early 2000s, and I cite a couple of review articles here by some of the leading individuals, um, was, a, was a different approach. The idea was to use smaller chemical libraries, um, as shown here, uh, or uh, that have uh, smaller molecular weights, so compounds uh, less than 300 uh, Daltons. Um, these will not have very high affinities for the target, but they provide other advantages. One is, as shown in the cartoon in the lower right, these fragments can fit more effectively into the pockets they bind to, giving higher quality interactions that can then be elaborated. Um, and you actually get a better coverage of chemical space with a smaller library uh, when you use fragments. That is, if you think about high throughput screening, the number of molecules that can have molecular weights greater than 300 um, is very, very large. And even with a large library, you're only covering a fraction of that space. But if you reduce the accessible compound size, then even a small library can cover a greater fraction of chemical space. In addition, in our case, we can pick libraries that are biased towards targets that have certain features, in this case, metalloenzymes. So without going into greater detail, uh, suffice to say, we've used this fragment-based drug discovery approach to address the problem. So this isn't new with metalloenzymes. As a matter of fact, one of the earliest studies by Stephen Fezzik and co-workers on fragment-based drug discovery and using a specific method called SAR by NMR that is using NMR to identify fragment leads um, focused on a matrix metalloprotease shown here on the left, um, a zinc-dependent metalloenzyme. Interestingly, though, when the study was done in the late 90s, um, there's, you can see a cartoon of, of, the, po of the active site pocket uh, in the center of this slide in the sort of the gray boxes. And what you'll see is they were primarily dividing the active site into two pockets, the pocket where the zinc was, the active site zinc, and a hydrophobic pocket labeled S1 prime. And what was done in the study was fragment-based drug discovery, but where the fragments bound to the zinc were, was, a, was a simple uh, hydroxamic acid as shown in the blue box and acetohydroxamic acid. And all the variation, all the exploring of fragments was done uh, for the S1 prime pocket. So no exploration of the zinc binding pocket was done. So again, there was this bias against using hydroxamic acids. Um, uh, Stephen Fezzik did do follow-up studies where they did do some variability 
of the uh, looking at fragments for the metal binding pocket, um, but they were rather limited. And so this, again, attracted our attention when I was a, a young professor saying, well, why wouldn't you look at the many, many hundreds of ligands, thousands you could think of to bind that zinc? So that's sort of the basis of what we were interested in. And so back in 2011, some time ago now, uh, we published our first uh, library. Um, you can see here of fragments. Uh, we called it an, M actually at the time we called it a chelator fragment library, but um, chelator is sort of a bad word in, um, in the medicinal community. And so we changed it to an MVP library. And you can see uh, the variety of different ligands that we use for this um, chemistry. I can see I'm already running a little short on time, so I'm going to jump through this. But su suffice to say, this was the general idea. We, we picked compounds available from the Aldrich catalog, um, from, uh, that we had, some that we had to make, but we you know, provided a wide variety of different ligands one could use to bind a metal in a protein active site, including the hydroxamic acid shown on the right is actually fragment G1 on this table. So we have the hydroxamic acid in there also as a sort of an internal control, if you will. So what I want to do is show you what we've been doing lately. We published that library almost 10 years ago now, how we've tried to enrich that library to make it more drug-like, to introduce new chemical functional groups that will give us a, a, a greater shot on goal when approaching metalloenzymes. So there's a lot of compounds we could just buy or simply make in the literature, but we wanted to think about how to further expand and enrich that library as well as make it more suitable for drug development. And the way we decided to do that was the application of the concept of isosteres. And so again, I'm going to be brief so that I stay on time, but the core principle of isosteres, which is a, a core principle in medicinal chemistry, is the idea of replacing a problematic functional group with a related functional group that exhibits similar volume, shape, but changes the physical chemical, physiochemical properties in such a way that you can change the biological um, pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic properties of the molecule, such as solubility, uptake, and toxicity, to make your molecule say have same affinity or similar affinity for a target, but better drug-like properties. And Professor Carlo Ballatori in the School of Pharmacy at UC San Diego is a good friend and colleague and his arrival at UCSD inspired a lot of our work. And this is a paper from his group where you can see that this um, aeropropyl carboxylic acid um, if you, if you want to, uh, he actually made a, a many, many, all, every dot on this plot represents a different isosteer for the carboxylic acid one of which is shown, tetrazole 16, to show how you can have, again, a compound that might have similar binding properties to a target, but vastly different physiochemical properties, which are shown on the three axes, uh, pKa on the right, so acidity, permeability along the x-axis at the bottom, and um, lipophilicity along the uh, left, the y-axis. So we wanted to apply this to metalloprotein inhibition, um, metalloenzyme inhibition, and so Ben Dick, a recent a PhD graduate from my lab, uh, we came up with the idea of taking a simple MBP, in this case, picolinic acid shown on the upper left, and um, making isosteres of that. So looking at Carlo's paper and picking many of the carboxylic acid isosteres and making a bunch of isosteres of picolinic acid. And um, this was uh, something we could do. So you see 24 different um, iso uh, isosteres on this slide that he made, that Ben made, or some case you could purchase even some of these. And the question was, of course, okay, we know these are isosteres. We know they will change physiochemical properties to one extent or another, and that's, that's fine. That's traditional isosteer chemistry. But we had the further question of how would this affect metal binding and metalloenzyme inhibition, right? That was a question in the metalloenzyme field with isosteres like this that hadn't been answered. That is, will all these compounds still bind metal ions? Will they bind metal ions in the same way? Will they have similar affinities and will they inhibit metalloins in similar ways? So if we make an isosteer and it changes physiochemical properties, but no longer inhibits our target because metal binding has been uh, ruined or, or eliminated, then that's not very useful for what we're trying to do. So that was a question we were trying to answer. And we went back to some very, very old school inorganic chemistry to do this. This was a work that uh, I started, uh, and obviously many people before me started, but we started in my lab as a simple model for understanding metal binding in an enzyme-like active site. And so we made simple trisprazole borate model complexes of these different ligands. So what you can see in the upper left is a, is a chemical drawing of a, of a trisprazole borate zinc complex that acts as a very, very rudimentary model 
for a uh, zinc ion in a metalloenzyme with a trishistidine coordination site. And these have been studied for years by people like Varenkamp and Parkin and many, many others, Trofimenko, of course, being the father of these um, trisprazobory ligands. Um, and so we use these as a simple structural model for how does our ligand, the ligand we're interested in, the MBP ligand bind. And now we're calling them MBIs for metal binding isosteres. And so what you can see here is, um, you know, a number of the isosteres from the free previous page and we crystallized others. And what we found generally was that they all bound similar to picolinic acid. So picolinic acid binds to this model in a bidentate fashion using the pyridine nitrogen and the carboxylic acid oxygen. And you can see that many of these isosteres um, do bind in a, similar, in a similar manner. So that was encouraging that we could change physiochemical properties and maintain metal binding, at least in this model setting. In addition, I just highlighted two of the complexes that did something interesting. And this is the kind of thing you always look for and get excited by as a chemist when you don't just see what you expect, but you see something interesting that you didn't expect. And so with ligands 21, MBIs 21 and 23, which share a lot of similar structural features, we notice that the trisprazo borate complex uh, that is formed uh, actually discharges one of the pyrazole ligands from the metal center, and that um, is replaced by a solvent molecule on the metal center, creating a, a, a unique five coordinate complex in that case. This is something in my lab of 20 years of making trisprazo borate complexes with these types of ligands we have never seen occur. So we think it's, it's, it's real, it's inherent to that particular ligand, and it has implications for using this ligand in a metalloenzyme active site. It could have negative implications, but it could be beneficial as well. I'm gonna speed things along again because I, I know I'm short on time. So just very simply to say is that just going through this exercise of creating metal binding isosteres, I think we came up with some really interesting compounds um, that as a traditional coordination or inorganic chemist, one might not think of for binding metal centers. This um, oxetane one was particularly interesting and I just show a, a, a rotating uh, version of the crystal structure here. Because remember when you're thinking about drug development, maybe from a more practical or commercial standpoint, having novel chemical matter, interesting new structures, is, is a way to get patent protection, for example, if you wanna develop a drug around this. Think about the fact that I mentioned that all pharmaceutical companies basically, or many, were focused on the hydroxamic acid as their sole metal binding group. Well, that makes it harder and harder and harder to carve out intellectual property that you might wanna protect if you're trying to develop a new life-saving drug. But here, we've developed a molecule to the best of my knowledge that hasn't been reported in the literature prior to our work and has certainly hasn't been used for inhibiting a metalloenzyme or probably any enzyme for that matter. And so this makes it easier to, to, in a sense, commercialize. And that might sound a little superficial or maybe a little too capitalistic. Um, coming from America, I could sort of understand that. But there's real value in that because pharmaceutical companies won't advance technology if they can't protect it intellectually or with patents. So there is a value in these um, novel compounds. So uh, again, I'm gonna go a little bit quickly through this. This is simply to say that we measure the physiochemical properties of many of these isosteres. And the long and the short of it is that they do span a very wide range uh, far from our original carboxylic acid. So they do achieve classic isosteer features. That is, we retain the metal binding, but we also uh, change physiological properties. So that's what we were intending to do. In addition, we tested our isosteers against a couple of enzyme targets to see if not only did we retain metal binding uh, in our model complex, but did we retain metal binding uh, and in the, in the context of metalloenzyme inhibition. And so we screened our library against two targets, uh, influenza, and, influenza endonuclease, which is a, an important metalloenzyme for the flu virus, and then human carbonic anhydrase 2, uh, a, a target uh, for a variety of conditions, including glaucoma. And the parent compound, uh, picolinic acid, is known to inhibit the influenza endonuclease, but does not inhibit um, human carbonic anhydrase. And so we wanted to see, does the isosteer change the selectivity or the pattern of inhibition uh, of, of uh, the parent compound? And what you see in the columns there, so this is sort of a heat map, a brighter color like red means greater inhibition, a darker color means less inhibition. You can see for the most part that all of our isosteers still inhibit 
um, endonuclease. So that's great because that's what picolinic acid inhibits. And some even do it better, the ones in orange and red. So two, four, seven, and nine. So actually some isosteres have a better affinity for the active site. Conversely, human carbonic anhydrase, most of the isosteres don't hit that enzyme, and that's great because we don't want to introduce new off-target selectivity. You will notice that compound 5, one of our isosteres, uh, has very high activity for human carbonic anhydrase. At first, we were concerned, but then we realized that isosteer is the molecule shown in the center of this slide, which is an aryl sulfonamid, and all aryl sulfonamids, basically all aryl sulfonamids, inhibit carbonic anhydrase extremely tightly. As a matter of fact, the clinical, there are clinically used drugs to inhibit carbonic anhydrase and they are aryl sulfonamides. So that was at least consistent with the chemistry of that isosteer. Okay, so in the last few slides here, I just wanna highlight the fact that we recently published a new study looking at the other part of our isosteer process. So uh, we took picolinic acid and we mixed up the carboxylic acid with different isosteers. We did a smaller study here saying, what about if we change the pyridine group for different aromatic heterocycles? How does that affect metal binding and of course, physiochemical properties? Um, this actually, it says online contents, but I just got the page numbers for this today. So this can be uh, viewed online and, and cited. Um, and so you can see here, we, we looked at a series of different heterocycles, one through five, the top row that all contain a, a carboxylic acid, and then going down each column, 1A, 1B, 1C, et cetera, um, we did the same set of five isosteres, or actually four isosteres in the parent compound for each, um, for each heterocycle. And I'm just gonna show you some of the modeling, the uh, trisprazoborate model studies. So what you can see here, if we take the parent set, compounds one through four all bind in a bidentate fashion with the, er the uh, aryl heterocycle and the carboxylic acid, except for heterocycle five on the far right, where donor ability of that nitrogen appears to be so weak that only carboxylic acid coordination that is observed for the benzoxazole. If we look at some of the isosteres, we do see some patterns. So here we see more variability. This is a actually a combined hydroxamic acid isosteer. So this is really interesting because we have two binding modes. One is a conventional hydroxamic acid, sort of the uh, poster child for metalloenzyme inhibition. And the other is the combination of that ligand with the heterocycle. What you see is compounds two and four bind through the heterocycle while compounds one, three, and five bind as a hydroxamic acid. And so what one, three, and five have in common is that they're all the one, two isomers of the heterocycle while two and four that bind through the heterocycle are one, three isomers of the heterocycle. This remained a, a consistent pattern. So if we look at a totally different isosteer, these tetrazoles, again, the one, two isomers, one, three, and five, in this case, all bind monodentate only through the tetrazole nitrogen, while compounds two and four, the one, three isomers, bind in a bidentate fashion through our heterocyclic arene and through the tetrazole. So again, we can learn something about how using different isosteres are going to give us different coordination modes. Okay, I need to sum up because we're running out of time. I just wanna highlight other work from our lab looking at isosteres based on completely different molecular scaffolds that aren't picolinic acid based. And that work was published and that was done by an, another recent graduate from my lab, uh, Dr. Rebecca Adamek. I also wanna note that uh, we have used this chemistry to um, found a antibiotics drug development company called Forge Therapeutics. Um, and uh, they are, um, are making good progress on non-hydroxamate um, uh, LPXC inhibitors. The, if you go back to the slide, I told you about the hydroxamic acid being consistently used over 20 years for the same target. Forge has, has had great success, and I hope even more success, developing non-hydroxamic um, acid inhibitors of LPXC. Finally, I need to thank my group. I've mentioned uh, 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 Dr. Uh, ben Dick and Dr. Rebecca Adamek, who've contributed this work. I also wanna recognize Dr. Ali Chen, who also did some isosteer work before leaving my lab. Uh, my group is socially distancing like everybody else these days, and I wanna thank them all for their hard work and diligence through these tough times. Uh, these are all the former members of my group. And finally, just to thank the funding agencies, primarily the National Institutes of Health in the United States, and uh, my colleagues at UCSD. And I'll pause there so not to go over too much. 
Thank you very much, Seth, for the very interesting uh, talk. And sorry again for the short interruption before you started. I think uh, your intro was was then basically chopped off. Um, but nevertheless, there are a few questions, and let's start with that. Um, so the first one by Lukas Roth. Um, great talk, Seth. Thanks very much. Are you using any other metalloenzyme models beyond the trispirazolyl borate, or if not, are you aware of other models? Yeah, so we are, um, let me say this, there are certainly many other models uh, for, the, for the very rich uh, variety of metalloenzyme active sites that one might be interested in, in inhibiting. Um, we haven't done a, a, that much model chemistry in, in my lab since my early days. As a matter of fact, all the work I just showed you is our first big v return visit to sort of model chemistry. We've much more focused on pushing the medicinal chemistry forward, working with the enzymes, actually trying to use enzymes as our models, right? We can get crystal structures of our models with inhibitors and fragments bound. And so that in some ways is a little bit more exciting and interesting for us. But there are certainly many other model compounds that we could look at. Um, there's probably some interesting chemistry there that we're missing um, by having not explored it. And just recently in my lab, in my lab we are looking at a few alternatives um, to the trisprazole borate um, just to, to sort of answer, I guess, your question, just to see how it mixes things up, how it changes things a little. But in general, there are a lot of models, like hundreds, if not thousands, but we've only really focused on the trisprazole borate. Uh, thank you, thank you, Seth. Um, another question by Andre Faria Vieira um, about the chirality. So, if you if you consider chirality and then regarding properties, activity, solubility, and so forth. Um, certainly, chirality is are, uh, always important in drug development. Um, most of our fragments, and this is not uncommon in fragment-based drug discovery. Uh, most of our fragments, if not all of them, um, are achiral. Um, so chirality will usually come in in our compounds as we elaborate them. So I think that's something actually I failed to mention when introducing fragment-based drug discovery. I apologize for that because my focus of the talk was on the fragments. But the fragment, of, of course, when you find one, is not sufficient to be a metalloenzyme inhibitor or a drug. You use that fragment as sort of a base point or an anchoring point from which you will create a larger molecule that's elaborated, that will give you better specificity, affinity, and et cetera, to get a more drug-like molecule. So it's sort of a precursor to something that you would see in, in high-throughput screening. Um, and so as you do that elaboration process, often chiral centers will be introduced and will be something you'll have to address. But in much of our fragment work, we, we, we tend to avoid chiral centers. Um, and if we do have a chiral center, we often just would use the molecule as a racemate because we just want to find those initial hits and then if we, if we find a chiral molecule that's a hit, then we can always separate the isomers out and see if there's a big difference between the two. Thank you, Seth. Um, the next question, which is a bit more, let's say, uh, philosophical or provocative by Kyle Go, um, And he's asking why metalloenzymes are not more widely used in the pharmaceutical and medicinal industry, if, even though it's clear that there is certainly a need for those and uh, a good application. Yeah, it's a really good question, and it's one that I've been asking myself for 20 years, um, and is part of why we started our own biotech company to try to fill that void. Um, I think there's a variety of reasons. Um, I think it's, I don't want to sound arrogant in any way, but I do think there was a lack of knowledge of bioinorganic and inorganic chemistry in the pharmaceutical field. Um, Pharmaceutical companies don't tend to hire inorganic chemists uh, over organic chemists or people more traditionally trained. Um, and I think that's why there was an over-reliance on the hydroxamic acid group. Um, there's also been a long-standing perception that if you have a molecule that binds a metalloenzyme or binds a metal period, that it will be very nonspecific, that it's going to bind all kinds of other advantageous metals in the body or it will have a lot of off-target effects. Um, but that's simply, and my group has published some work to try to dispel that myth and, and, and existing work in the field pretty much shows that isn't the case because yes, if you throw a simple chelator into a biological system like picolinic acid, it will bind lots of metals. But when you elaborate that compound, make it something that's more selective and specific for a target, and then you're giving it at low doses as you should if you have a, a um, selective uh, inhibitory compound, then that issue of lack of specificity or um, off-target metal binding, it just isn't, isn't uh, 
uh, isn't really that valid. So I think that's been a big part of it too. Matter of fact, uh, just to elaborate a little bit, I'll, I'll leave the names unknown, but I actually met someone who was very frustrated. They were a, a computational chemist at a pharm major pharmaceutical company. They were actually targeting an iron dependent metalloenzyme. They had identified a bunch of compounds, but then their pharmacologists did a test for metal binding found that their drug bound metals and they eliminated them from the program, even though their target was a metalloenzyme. So this kind of conundrum of sort of automatically throwing things away that bind metals, even in the case where you're trying to target a metalloenzyme, I think has created some confusion there that is um, that sort of resulted in the lack of uh, more aggressive pursuit uh, of these types of inhibitors. Yeah, thank you, Seth. I can I can definitely agree that also in the let's say more broad field of chemical biology, um, there is definitely not inorganic chemistry involvement overall, and it's definitely important to somehow get the message out there that this kind of research is very very valuable to the community and also for translational research in general. Um, another question by Sandeep Verma. Uh, hi, Sandeep. Um, do you foresee any use of machine learning in fragment-based drug discovery? Oh, uh, absolutely. Um, I would imagine that there is much machine learning already going on in fragment-based drug discovery that's well beyond my knowledge of medicinal chemistry and the state of the art in that area, both in academia and in, in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, in our lab, oh, and I actually really appreciate this question because I totally failed to mention that this work, all of the work I showed you today uh, on, the, on the ISIS theories has been a collaboration with Professor Andy McCammon, a computational chemist in my department, and his postdoctoral fellow, Ashay Patel. And uh, I'm sorry, I, I was very neglectful for not mentioning that earlier. They have given us computational support to try to better understand these binding patterns with our fragments. So that said, um, I think machine learning and artificial intelligence is probably widely used in fragment-based drug discovery and drug discovery more broadly. We haven't used it that much. We've done these modeling studies with Professor McCammon and his group but we haven't used um, these types of methods as much because computational methods um, are not as robust with metal centers and metalloenzymes, especially when what we're primarily interested in is that metal ligand interaction. So higher level calculations, things like uh, DFT type calculations, sort of more atomistic type calculations can be very good. Um, but a lot of the sort of modeling and docking approaches don't handle these metal centers as well. And I think that's something that we've been interested in for a long time. And we'd be very interested in, in collaborating on if someone could, um, you know, uh, robustly and rapidly predict uh, computationally how these uh, compounds might bind in an active site. But I think that there is, there is a bit of a technical gap because of the metal ion, not because of the technology as a whole, but specifically with the, metal, the metal ion. Okay, I think one last question um, by Eduardo Souza. Um, do you have any strategy of preventing these metal binding compounds to reach cells with metals already bound? And is that an issue in general? So that's a really good question, Ed. Uh, I appreciate you being on all the way from Brazil. Um, I, I, so I don't have a good answer for that. What I can tell you is that some metalloenzyme inhibitors, uh, like many other small molecule drugs, that have, say, a carboxylic acid group uh, are administered as salts often for solubility reasons or, or polymorph reasons. So I don't think there's an inherent problem with metal binding, um, but I can't say it's something we've specifically studied uh, and I don't have a, a real good sense for. Uh, certainly many of the metalloenzyme inhibitors that are uh, clinically used uh, do get into cells. Um, we know that there's not a lot of free transition metals, certainly in biological systems, but there's certainly a lot of, um, you know, group one and group two metals like sodium and magnesium, potassium around that could bind to these uh, molecules. Um, but I guess I don't have a good answer for you. Probably from the formulation and, ph and pharmacokinetic side, it's a very important question, but it's not something that we've studied extensively in my lab. So I, I don't have really a good answer. There's just one one question popping up for the third time. So um, Sidraran Muke Savaran was asking about generally co-crystallization during the course of the study. Um, I'm not entirely sure what is meant by this, but Seth, do you do you have an answer? Uh, if you're saying uh, when I hear co-crystallization, I usually think about a, a macromolecular uh, protein crystal structure. And so uh, that's what I'll answer to. Uh, we have done, we have about, 
out of my lab, about a half a dozen studies where we published a co-crystal structure of either an MBP or MBI fragment with a metalloenzyme or a full length inhibitor, a more uh, an elaborated compound with a metalloenzyme um, inhibitor uh, th that we've since sized bound. There are uh, hundreds, if not thousands of published crystal structures in the protein data bank uh, of uh, metalloenzyme inhibitors or potential inhibitors bound to target. So that, that's certainly something one can do. Thank you very much, Seth. Um, and thank you very much for the very, very interest, uh, interesting talk and for the very lively discussion. Um, I think there are a few, a few more questions in the chat. So if you have time, maybe you can go back and have a few chats with uh, the people asking the questions. I'm just going to click through your backup slides because we okay. don't need them now. Um, well, and thank then, you again, and thanks everybody for signing on. Thank you, yes. Um, and then we will come, once I'm done with clicking through, with our last talk of today. It's Marie Hefern from UC Davis. Thank you very much for being here. Um, I think it's pretty, pretty early still in California, so thanks again. I think this is amazing. Um, Marie did her Bachelor of Science at the University of Southern California, LA, and moved to the Univers Northwestern University um, for her PhD with Professor Mede. Um, after a postdoctoral stay with Chris Chang at UC Berkeley, she started her independent lab at UC Davis in 2017. Um, the Hefern lab is really a truly interdisciplinary and translational laboratory sitting at the interface of bioinorganic chemistry, analytical chemistry, chemical biology, but also met metabolism and nutrition. And uh, what I find really interesting is that they really want to uncover the roles and applications of metals in the endocrine system. I think that's very something unique. Um, and also that's why they term this um, kind of research metalloendocrinology. I'm sorry. Um, Maria has, uh, Marie has, of course, uh, won numerous awards and was, for example, part of the, of the two 2019 Chemo Chem Bio Talents class at Chem Bio Chem. Uh, Chem. And her paper um, for that issue was, was uh, one of the most accessed ones from the journal in that year. Um, and without further ado, Marie, the stream is yours. Thank you, Ruben. Uh, and thank you to everyone who uh, decided to tune in. I guess it's morning for me or evening or afternoon, wherever you are. Um, it really is just a pleasure uh, to get to participate in this symposium because the, the first paper that we published in this area was actually in Chem Biochem. So um, I, I'm really grateful for that. Uh, and so the work that our lab has been doing um, in a little bit less than three years is really focusing on an area that we think is widely ignored uh, relative to um, other areas of bioinorganic chemistry. And that is what's happening to the metals in the extracellular space. And so what I hope to do today is focus on one story that um, we have been working on, but then at the end, I'll hopefully give you an overview of what else our lab is doing in this area. Um, and so I wanted to start with this picture that uh, some of us in the bioinorganic community uh, look to a lot, and that is the intracellular metabolism of metals. And so we are familiar with how metals are trafficked in and out of cells. Um, we focus quite a bit on metals bound to proteins, and so Seth alluded to some of that. Um, but interestingly enough, there is this um, this issue that many uh, research and health seems to think that metals are slightly toxic, um, but a lot of the bioinorganic community as well as the imaging world is starting to see that there are ways that metals are actually beneficial, can be useful for imaging, um, and that there is much more complex metal biology in the cell than just the free metal ion floating in solution. And so there's been some work to uncover what's going on with what's called the labile pool of metals. And so these are the metals that are not necessarily tightly bound to ligands and so they can freely exchange in solution. And so while these metals are not necessarily free ions, they may be loosely bound. Um, and the interest in this, this pool of metals is that they may play a role in signaling. Um, if you can think about metals as being uh, signal transmission factors that can be involved in fast exchange. Um, what we have become really interested in is 
Um, in this picture, we see many of the metals getting exported, and there's actually a lot of open questions as to what happens to those metals once they leave the cell. Um, this area, uh, this particular locale, uh, means that you're actually diluting the metals, and so much of the information is hard to find and is sometimes lost. Um, but even more complex is this extracellular space is not just uh, the white space on the screen, but actually involves an exchange between what's called the interstitial space or the fluid that bathes the organs or the cells, um, and then the exchange of what happens once it gets through the blood vessels into those blood vessel cells and then into the blood itself. And especially now we're seeing that there's a lot of value in blood tests. And the question that I'd like to pose, and I'll show you a little bit of how we're starting to address this at the end, is what's happening to the metals in the blood um, Oh, in a dynamic way. So not necessarily just when you're collecting it and you coagulate it in the tube, but is there exchange of information? Are metals more than just being transported outside um, in the blood, but can they actually be playing an active role? And so one of the ways that we're starting to try to uncover how metals are playing a role in the extracellular space is starting to look at the uh, um, at peptides. And the reason for that is if we look through the literature, there is much work being done in understanding how metals may have aberrant functions um, or play roles in the pathologies of peptides such as amyloid beta and Alzheimer's disease and alpha-synuclein in Parkinson's disease. And this is actually um, one of the areas that I got really interested in during my training um, was you know, what is the role of the metals in amyloid beta um, and in these short peptides um, and what's interesting to me about these peptides is that their structures are not necessarily as fixed as you would find in a protein active site. Um, but beyond these two examples, there are actually some hints that metals play uh, active roles in healthy physiology, so not just the aberrant roles. And so I have a few examples that I'm showing here. The first on the left is hepcidin, uh, which is actually the only known hormone that uh, regulates a metal uh, transition metal biology. And so this is a hormone that regulates uh, iron biology, but interestingly enough, contains a copper binding motif. Um, there, of course, is insulin that many of us are familiar with in the context of diabetes. And insulin relies on zinc uh, to stabilize its hexameric form for efficient storage in the pancreas. And then finally, um, in the very right of this picture, there is copper GHK, which um, is actually in a lot of skin creams because it seems to be um, I believe to play a role in re uh, youth rejuvenation and um, as well as wound healing. But interestingly enough, is a very short peptide that has a high affinity for copper and can be isolated with copper bound to it. And so with these three that uh, we have in the bottom, the thing that they have in common is that they are found in the blood and they are considered hormones in one way or another. And this really intrigued me when I started my independent position because hormones themselves are transient as are metals as they're being uh, transported in and out. And the fact that these metals are present in trace amounts makes them even more intriguing as to um, how they're distributed, not only within the cell, but from one organ to another. And so we actually scoured the literature and um, decided we wanna invite as many people who are interested in this area to consider it, um, which is that can metals play um, an active role in hormone function? And so we termed this area metalloendocrinology um, the endocrine system, as many of you know, is the system that involves the chemical messengers that communicate from one organ to another. So it's our long distance communication that, that keep our body in line. And so uh, the question that we would like to pose um, is, uh, do metals actually play some sort of post-translational regulatory role for these hormones? And so um, one way that we envision this, at least with peptides, happening is that uh, metals themselves um, can impose structural changes on peptides as we've seen with the aberrant peptides like amyloid beta. Um, but it does ne doesn't necessarily have a huge activation energy barrier to overcome uh, a huge rearrangement in structure as you might have with a protein. And so um, our, our overall hypothesis is that metals may actually serve as regulatory factors for these peptide hormones. Um, there are hints of this in literature. Um, as to ways that this can happen. And the three ways that we are considering is, um, as in the case of insulin, whether metals play a role both in the storage and release, um, taking advantage of the coordination chemistry to store and release these peptide hormones. Um, and then once it gets to the blood, do metals play a role in stabilizing these hormones so that they can 
have a, an improved bioavailability or even destabilizing it as a way to improve clearance. And then a more classical look perhaps is one where metals can change the structure of uh, these peptide hormones and structural changes could uh, activate or deactivate receptor binding. And so there are a lot of open questions here and I'm hoping to show you one way that our lab is starting to approach these types of questions. And that is with a hormone that is related to insulin. Um, so many of us know that um, insulin is released uh, from the pancreas and then signals changes to regulate our blood glucose levels. Uh, less popular in the literature actually is this, pep this peptide um, that is indicated in green in the pro-insulin protein and that is C-peptide. So C-peptide, just by giving, by looking at its name, um, is uh, was considered to be unimportant um, in the function of insulin, but was believed to serve primarily as a way to connect to the A and B chains of insulin. And so it was used as a secondary biomarker because its uh, circulatory half-life was um, higher than for insulin, so making it um, a longer lived marker uh, for diabetic patients. But what has become quite interesting um, is that while this was initially considered inert um, and mostly a byproduct of insulin production, increasing work is starting to show that this peptide actually has its own bioactivity that is independent of insulin. And so part of this work has shown that um, C-peptide replacement therapy may actually improve not necessarily glucose regulation in diabetic patients, but in downstream effects of, um, of diabetic complications and that those include things like neuropathies or um, numbness or tingling um, in nerves, as well as cardiovascular um, effects. And so while there is some promise for C-peptide replacement therapy, much of this progress was, has been hampered by a lack of understanding of how C-peptide actually functions. So how can you modulate this peptide uh, to be more favorable for the, the targeted effect? And in fact, um, the, there's no known uh, molecular target for C-peptide, uh, which of course has been intriguing for us as a group to start diving into this. And so why I got interested in this in the first place um, was that there's actually an accidental finding that zinc can activate C-peptide function. And so um, in this paper uh, by Spence and Meyer, um, what they found was if you take the blood um, of diabetic patients and then and then control that and compare that to control patients, uh, add C peptide and add zinc and then add that back um, into endothelial cells, that C peptide with zinc actually increases the activation of C peptide in releasing ATP, with, which is related to blood vessel dilation. Uh, and so um, from the bioinorganic perspective, um, looking at this sequence that I have here. Uh, there are none of the classical zinc binding sites that um, we would normally look for. Uh, so this was intriguing to me, uh, just to ask where exactly is the zinc binding? Um, is zinc a, a, a native uh, partner for this peptide or could it be other metal ions? And so one of the challenges that we run into with looking at um, hormone dynamics and uh, extracellular space is thinking about what exactly would be a biologically um, relevant model for studying these effects. Um, many cell culture models actually don't have functioning endocrine systems. And so uh, keep trying to figure out how we can start to pursue biologically relevant questions um, requires um, some understanding of ways that we can screen for or detect whether metal binding may play an active role. And so uh, with C-peptide, it's actually a pretty intriguing peptide, uh, bioactive peptide, in that while many bioactive peptides bind to extracellular receptors, uh, C-peptide has also been posited to function by getting internalized into the cell. And so we saw this as one way that we could take advantage of to screen um, by basically using um, internalization of C-peptide as a functional tool. And so we did this first to screen um, whether C-peptide is in fact affected by metals in a cell culture model. And so what I'm about to show you are some fluorescent images from immunofluorescent labeling of C-peptide um, and that you'll see that in green. Um, and so this is just an example where, um, of uh, a control vehicle as well as C-peptide. 
Um, when we add C peptide, you can see that we get green fluorescence um, indicating internalization into the cells. And I'll show you some images, but I'll show you a plot in just a second. Um, but we took these cells, added both C peptide and metals, um, uh, both simultaneously and in varying orders. But the main thing that was surprising to us was that um, while zinc did not have any noticeable effects in these particular studies, chromium and copper both seem to decrease the internalization of C peptide. And so um, you can see here in this plot that, um, that chromium and copper bring down the internalization to the fluorescent level that is um, almost as low as a vehicle. Um, and so we thought we did a few um, spectroscopic studies and that is the topic of the paper that we published in ChemBioChem. But the piece that I wanna highlight here um, is we wanted to understand what would cause that change in cellular internalization. And so this is a circular dichroism spectrum that looks at um, secondary structure of the peptide. C peptide is largely random coil and I'll get to the challenges with that in a second. Um, but what we did see was a modest change in the structure when copper is added, no induction of any clear secondary structure, but a modest change at least in the circular dichroism spectrum. However, um, this effect was not specific to copper. We actually saw this effect happening across all the metals. And so um, what we did see was that metals did seem to have um, effects on C-peptide that were specific to the identity of the metals. Uh, and we actually put together this, this um, graphical representation of where we thought we were in the field, which is that metals may actually be a missing piece of the mechanistic puzzle of how C-peptide functions. Our assay only caught one with copper and chromium, but there may actually be other roles, for example, with zinc that our particular cellular assay did not catch. Um, and so uh, we did wanna actually understand the copper binding. We thought that was quite intriguing, especially because in the pancreas, uh, zinc and copper levels are, are um, can get up to the millimolar range. And then in the extracellular space, these are actually in the micromolar range, albeit bound to other proteins, um, some identified, some not. And so the next step for us was really understanding exactly how copper was binding as our circular diachroism spectrum did not indicate any major changes in structure that we could detect. Uh, and so I just wanted to bring it back to if anyone in the audience has been trying to study um, these relatively unstructured peptides, there are a few challenges associated with it, but this that requires us to, to use other techniques than what is typically used for standard biophysical measurements. Um, and so one is that the peptide is largely random coil, as I mentioned. And so um, in looking at um, this uh, peptide, we were, if the peptide is largely random coil, backbone binding may induce a change, but not necessarily one that's detectable by circular dichroism if there is no largely fixed structure. Um, and so uh, we suspected that the backbone could be playing a role because if you look at the rest of the peptide, uh, while there are some carboxylic acids in the amino acid sequence, as well as some hydroxyl groups with the serines, glutamates, and dyspartic acids, uh, these are not typically your copper two binders that you would find in the literature. And so we suspected backbone binding. Um, side chain binding presents some challenges in that we don't actually have a lot of complexity in the sequence. And so um, even something like a histidine is not present, but beyond that, we have four glutamates and one aspartic acid. So carboxylates, um, if, what, if either one of these bind, they would just look like carboxylates binding. Um, and then we have a lot of nonpolar um, amino acids as well uh, that actually don't seem, didn't seem to contribute to any binding. And so the question is, how do you tease apart when your side chains are pretty similar in nature in terms of what can bind. How do you tease apart which ones the metals are binding to? Um, and so we thought that the first step was identifying the region of binding. Um, if we can't pinpoint just by spectroscopic data, what the amino acid identity is of binding. And so uh, to achieve this, we turned to peptide NMR. And so this is unlabeled NMR. Um, we make these peptides by solid phase peptide synthesis. Um, and so, uh, this is an N15 labeled. Um, and so this, the first step we wanted to do was just look at our proton NMR. And actually just by looking at the backbone uh, proton region, so this is what I'm showing you is the backbone amide and backbone CH alphas. 
uh, CH alpha protons of the peptide. Uh, the main thing that I want you to see from this is that the dispersion remains largely unchanged whether we add copper or zinc. And what that means to us is that there's a, uh, this lack of peak dispersion means that whether we have APO C peptide, meaning absence of metal or metal treated peptides, there's no apparent structural changes and there's no apparent fixed structure. So this uh, is consistent with the circular dichroism data, but it also presents some challenges in that we actually have a lot of peak overlap with this NMR. Um, uh, and uh, so we also look at the side chain protons and um, while this may look like just a bunch of overlapping peaks, we can actually tease apart some distinct changes that we see um, when we add copper and zinc. And so this was promising to us that we can actually use NMR as a way to probe where metals might actually be interacting. And so um, I'm not gonna go into the details of how to assign um, the peptide NMRs. And that's something that if you would like to email me or ask in the chat, I'm happy to go through that. Um, but we went through and analyzed all the protons that we could. Um, and uh, we took, uh, we plotted what we call a change in chemical shift or a delta-delta plot, um, which allows us to look at changes between the APOC peptide protons and the zinc bound or copper bound uh, protons. And so one thing I would like to point out is that copper two is in fact paramagnetic. And so the, the relaxation effects would mean that we get eradication of signal. Fortunately for us, I use, as you saw with the proton NMR, copper addition into the solution did not er fully eradicate um, the proton signals. And so we could actually use copper paramagnetism as a way to look for a, um, where copper might be binding based on where we get eradication of signal. And so what you'll see in the next plot is either a, a change in chemical shifts um, and that's indicated by what we have for zinc, where we would expect uh, zinc binding to shift the protons that um, are nearby or bound to the zinc, um, as well as a copper, um, the, the effects of copper where we're looking at eradication or broadening. And so I have those color coded in the next slide. And so <clears throat> um, I divided these up into uh, amide protons, CH alpha protons and the side chain protons. And so what we're looking at here is the, are the delta delta plots for the amide backbone and the CH alpha backbone. And what we notice with the zinc addition is that we see drastic changes in the NH backbone, suggesting that the zinc is in fact binding to the backbone. Um, with, uh, with copper C peptide, um, what we actually saw was not much change in the backbone, indicating that copper might in fact be binding to side chains instead, um, or at least, um, uh, so the, these, lack of, these uh, lack of changes you can see almost looks like there's no signal, but um, I'll show you in a second the color coding for the obliteration of signal. And so uh, when we look at the side chains, in contrast to what we saw with the amide backbones, the zinc addition did not have any large changes in the uh, backbone proton uh, chemical, or sorry, the side chain proton chemical shifts. Whereas what we have highlighted in red here um, is, uh, where we see loss of signal on the protons of the side chains when we add copper. And so what you will see here um, on the, the horizontal axis here is the peptide sequence. And so um, this is just an order from N to C. And so we see obliteration of signal primarily in the N-terminal region of our C peptide. And so um, we decided that the best way to start to analyze this data is um, to, to just graphically represent it this way. Um, uh, looking at where we have broadening of signal um, that's in blue, where we have obliterated signal that's in red, and then in green is where we have changes or shifts in signal that are larger than 0.02 that we considered significant. Um, and so what you can see here immediately is that the zinc and copper have very different effects. Um, I'm not showing it here, but we actually did some competition studies uh, by mass spec. Um, where we could uh, see that if we added zinc and copper to the C-peptide, the resulting mass spectrum primarily looked like copper bound to C-peptide. Uh, and so uh, even though um, in the biological data, zinc seemed to have an effect, um, uh, we were actually surprised to see that copper seems to have a, a competitive um, advantage to binding to C-peptide. And you can see here by NMR, uh, what I'm showing you here is at the very bottom is the APOC peptide when we add zinc. Um, 
what, what I have in asterisk in the purple spectrum for the plus zinc here um, is the, the distinct change that we're using to monitor zinc binding. Um, and then for copper, we can see that broadening as well as um, some distinct shifts, such as the loss of peaks at the 8.7 um, that actually gets absorbed uh, further into the 8.6 region of our NMR. Um, and then when we add zinc and then copper or copper than zinc or do simultaneous addition, what's interesting is that the resulting spectrum looks distinctly like the copper bound C peptide, indicating that this copper binding is actually binder uh, tighter than, than zinc at these concentrations. And so um, we once again went back to our immunofluorescence assay. And what we can see is that even in the biological assay, when we add zinc and copper at the same time, the resulting uh, image resembles that of just copper added to C-peptide. So this copper bind binding to C-peptide does appear to be a dominant effect. Uh, and so um, in addition to that, uh, we wanted to assess exactly how copper was binding, if it's binding to the N-terminal region, and whether this was biologically relevant in terms of its uh, thermodynamics. And so we performed some isothermal titration and calorimetry um, to understand this. And what we found was that there was a um, a near zero exchange in the number of protons, um, which is consistent with binding to carboxylate groups over the NH backbone, um, which, which you would expect there to be a proton exchange for that type of binding. Um, there seems to be a single site. And in addition to that, um, the, the uh, affinity for uh, copper seems to be in the nanomolar range, um, which while it's not uh, huge, or it's not extremely tight, is not insignificant either. Um, and I'm gonna go into some of the future directions we're taking with this as well. Um, and in addition to that, what was intriguing for us was that the binding seemed to be primarily entropically driven. Uh, and so without the, the, the massive changes in structure that we observed, this was surprising to us. Um, and so uh, this is something we're still looking into as well, um, but at least as informative as to what might be driving these interactions. And so we wanted to identify where exactly in the N-terminal region this copper is binding. Um, and so we men I mentioned that there are some carboxylate in this sequence and I've um, highlighted those um, in, um, in this sequence here. Um, and uh, with, our, with our colleague Dave Britt, and we could do uh, EPR to determine what the binding geometry and ligand identities were. Um, and so based on um, the, the EPR spectrum, we could detect that um, uh, the, the, the symmetry of the copper was square planar. Um, and the, the values um, were consistent with either four oxygen or three O one N coordination mode. Um, and by 2D EPR with high score, what we can see is um, in fact that there isn't any detectable uh, hyperfine splitting with nitrogen. Um, however, this was not labeled. And so it's very, very possible that any nitrogen binding um, could in fact uh, be a little bit too weak for us to detect by this method. Um, we did, we were uh, curious as to whether the serine or the hydroxyl group in the serine could participate in binding given that the ligand identity seems to uh, be largely oxygen containing. And uh, this is just some FTIR that we had done to show that we are in fact getting changes in the carboxylate peaks, but not any of the hydroxyl peaks. Um, and so our current model actually, I'm not showing any of the UV vis here, um, and that the UV vis is actually informative in that we have a lambda max for the D to D transition around six, between 630 and 650 nanometers, suggesting that we are getting some a 301N coordination. Uh, and so given that this uh, is occurring at the end terminus, um, our current model was that it was binding to the glutamate and the aspartic acid in positions three and four, as well as the end terminus. Um, and so the classical method that we would typically use to uh, determine metal binding is by mutating the peptide sequence or the protein uh, to eradicate metal binding in that sense. And so we performed um, some studies with mutants where we uh, actually mutated out the, uh, um, the glutamate in position three and aspartic acid in position four, um, as well as the double mutant here. Um, and uh, I'm sorry that this, it's not, the sequences are not showing up very well on mine, but um, we also looked at truncations where we only looked at the N terminus or the C terminus. We, um, 
And in both of these scenarios, uh, we did not look at the middle loop as this did not have any carboxylase that could bind. And what was interesting for us, I'm not gonna go into all the details of how we, um, of, of, of the data here, but um, we actually had just had this recently published in inorganic chemistry. And so some of that data is there, but this is just a summary um, is that when we do those mutations, um, we don't necessarily eradicate binding. We're still getting binding, but what was interesting is that the binding becomes far more promiscuous. And so um, there is something about the full length C peptide that is required to actually direct binding into the N-terminal region. When we, when we mutate um, uh, those amino acids, uh, we get um, a, 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 almost a, a shift into um, other parts of the peptide. And then when we do the truncations, we get binding and actually with very similar uh, thermodynamic values. However, we are getting uh, a mixture of species in these scenarios. Um, and so, I just wanted to bring it back to where we're going next um, with this work. Um, and so this was the puzzle that I showed you earlier. Um, and so one piece of the puzzle that we've uh, uncovered is that coordination appears to be happening at the E3 and D4. Um, and there seems to be a mixture, I didn't mention this in the, the FTIR, but a mixture of unidentate and bidentate carboxylate ligands, as well as what we suspect is the N-terminus. The full length peptide is required for not necessarily binding, but, but for specific binding. And this has some implications considering that the peptide seems to be largely unstructured. Another direction we're now starting to take. Um, so one thing that Seth had mentioned is that uh, you know, most, most of the pharmaceutical world seems to eradicate um, any sort of drugs that might be binding to metals, but we had to remember that metals are in fact bound to other species. And while this can serve as competition for something with a micromolar affinity like C peptide, what we're starting to explore is whether this binding is actually um, facilitating interactions to form terminary complexes with proteins like albumin. Um, in addition to that, um, we're understanding how copper may actually be affecting C peptide function. And if copper is in fact a missing piece of the puzzle, this will allow us to uncover um, possible receptors for C-peptide, as well as a biological mechanism by which C-peptide acts. Um, and another hypothesis that we're exploring is whether pe pe peptides like C-peptide may actually function by sequestering some of these um, extracellular pools as a way to regulate their availability. Um, and so I just wanted to briefly go over um, where else my lab has been taking this work. Um, since I'm a short in time, I'll go rather quickly through this. Um, so what I showed you is the targeted analysis we are doing. Um, we're also taking a larger scale peptidomics approach to discover metal binding peptides that are difficult to predict. As you see with C peptide, I would not have predicted copper binding to that sequence, but we do see that. And so we're taking some steps both chrom chromatographically as well as in analyzing our data to discover some of these peptides. Um, we're also uh, working to understand what it would take to even perturb the extracellular population of metals. Um, and that is um, actually, uh, there's not that much information out there since a lot of these effects are quite transient. And so I just wanted to highlight um, a piece of work that we're uh, actually about to submit. Um, and this is just some clinical work that we were able to do um, looking at dietary interventions with sugars. Um, and I'm happy to talk about this uh, either in the questions or um, if you want to contact me directly. Um, but we're trying to basically revisit whether the metal markers that we have for blood tests are satisfactory um, and um, uh, for, for studying metal status. And uh, what I wanted to briefly show you here is um, this plot that I'm showing on the left uh, is the standard way that we monitor ceruloplasmin, uh, which is a marker for copper status. Um, and when we intervene on these diets with different types of sugars, um, we don't find much change with ceruloplasmin, but we do with its enzyme activity, which is not typically monitored. Um, and interestingly enough, when we look at ICPMS of copper, these trends are, um, are more related to the enzyme activity than it is to um, the enzyme levels. And so um, there's a bit more work on that that we'll, we'll hopefully put in the publication. Uh, and beyond that, uh, looking at other areas outside of the cell, I'm um, just briefly mentioning a few ways we're doing this. Uh, one is um, looking also at small molecules and the roles that they may play. Um, and so the question that we have been starting to look at is whether the classical metal binding flavonoids 
uh, themselves may actually work as um, trafficking molecules for uh, these, uh, these metals. And so while um, these are very similar in structure, they have uh, different metal binding properties. Um, and the piece that we're starting to bring into this is um, how exactly this affects um, biological growth on uh, systems like a uh, yeast with a uh, copper import knockdown. Um, and so the question of whether these are actually chelators, ionophores, or something else. Um, and then, of course, uh, a major challenge is that the extracellular space is more dilute um, and transient as well. And so we're developing imaging agents that will hopefully illuminate what's happening to these metals outside the cell as well. Um, and so uh, I said, we're, everything we're trying to do in the lab takes it from interactions with biological molecules. We're trying to explore cellular dynamics. Um, as I showed you with some of the clinical studies, we're also trying to bring it into the whole organism. And uh, this is drawn as a cycle, but I think getting to attack these in several different areas and pieces will help us bring a fuller picture um, to the role that metals may play in the extracellular space. Um, and with that, I just wanna thank um, the people who, who have really just been champions in, in helping me start the lab and, and doing this work. Um, this work was primarily driven by Michael Stevenson, uh, who's currently a postdoc, leaving July 17th to start his faculty position at University of San Francisco. And he's actually gonna be exploring more of the um, thermodynamics and ITC um, of these metal binding peptides, as well as Jessica San Juan, uh, a grad student, Samuel Janice, and actually four undergrads played a role in this. Um, and so that's uh, Kylie Uyeda, Ian Farron, uh, Wayne Pham, and Ryan Neal. Um, and I just think really thankful to my group who I miss dearly since we, we haven't been able to see each other in person, um, but as well as all the funding sources who even in this time um, have just been really generous in supporting us. Um, and I want to thank all of you here and, and Ruben just for giving me the opportunity to share this work. Thank you very much, Marie. This was extremely exciting and I really love the translational part of your work. And I'm really looking very much forward to seeing uh, what you mentioned at the end with the cellular activity and the outreach to really, you know, this is, this is bioinorganic chemistry really, go, really going even further than biology, really into medicinal and application. I think this is really very exciting. And now let's, let's start with the first uh, questions. A few have arrived. Um, the first one comes from Rebecca Fernandez. Uh, Marie, great talk, super interesting. How does binding zinc instead of copper or misbinding copper by the C-peptide create downstream effects? Uh, that is a great question that we're trying to explore. I think I'll start with saying a challenge that we're still running into is mimicking uh, the effects in cell culture so that we have a little bit more control of time. Um, in many ways, we're like maybe doing it in the mouse study would be easier, um, but it uh, doesn't necessarily give us the time control that would help us tease this out. What we suspect is that um, copper may actually be serving as an inhibitory factor so that if copper is uh, bound to C-peptide, the, the zinc won't necessarily have the effects that, uh, that uh, Spence and Meyer had observed. Um, but that is something that we still need to substantiate. Thank you very much. Um, the, the next question comes from uh, Sergio Celis. Um, Marie, great talk. I wonder if you've planned to use this chemistry to sequester C-peptide and avid side effects in diabetes. Uh, yeah, so one of the pieces, the reason why we thought it was worthwhile to figure out the binding site um, of the C-peptide is if you wanna do biological studies, um, having a way to have a negative control or a mutated control would be really valuable. And we didn't entirely know where to do that. Having that in hand, um, we think it's actually, uh, we have enough information that we can actually put these into some of our mouse studies for diabetes to be able um, to isolate some of that. And um, I think there is a question, uh, the C-peptide has a very long half-life. And so uh, I think your question, I'm trying to find into the chat you said was, uh, to sequester C peptide. Um, the, so yeah, the one big question is, um, I don't wanna bring it back to bloodletting, which is so ancient, but doing some sort of plasma replacement therapy. Um, if C peptide is mutated, let's say, um, in diabetic patients, or if it seems to have eradicated metal binding, that would be something worth looking into. Um, and in terms of sequestering C peptide, I'm not, I'm, I'm gonna, because there isn't a whole dialogue here, um, I am not sure whether you mean sequestering C-peptide that's already in the blood and then trying to reduce its effects. That's a possibility. Uh, we would have to look a little bit more into the mechanism by which C-peptide works. 
as well as whether copper is sufficient to deactivate that in solution um, and how to stabilize that interaction so that you're not introducing unwanted copper into the cell or into the, the, the human. Thank you, Marie. Um, let's go for one more question by Misha Shoshan. Um, I think that was about the first part of your talk. Uh, what about the four glycine re residues? Um, they can be good binders for both zinc and copper, no? Yeah, so we were we initially had looked at the glycine residues um, to because we thought that it was binding to the backbone. However, without the backbone effects uh, for copper, um, we uh, that that's part of why we don't with with the carboxylates binding. Uh, we don't think that the glycines participate in copper, uh, and even with the zinc, because most of the changes were happening closer to the end terminus as well as part of the C terminus, the glycines do not seem to be participating directly in binding. However, I do think that the glycines are playing a role in orienting or allowing the flexibility of the structure so that perhaps uh, the peptide adopts a structure where the C terminus is occluded from metal binding. Okay, then, then a quick follow-up question uh, to the metal binding by um, Christina Cordas, um, and she asked if you would, if you also tried other bimetal, um, bi bivalent metals such as nickel or iron. We did, yeah. So uh, uh, we did a lot of the UV vis studies to look at binding for pretty much any of the first row D block uh, transition metals, and so. Uh, nickel does bind. Um, however, we did not see any distinct effects in the, the cellular assay. doesn't mean that it doesn't have effects, just none that we could see with that particular measure. Um, and iron, uh, I, I um, purposely ignored iron because it's quite complicated because it does seem that iron has effect, an effect on C-peptide in that if you look closely at the immunofluorescence data, the, dif the distribution of C-peptide is actually more punctated with iron than it is with any of the other metals. Um, however, it did not seem to be due to direct binding between the two. Um, and iron is actually a little bit challenging for us because when we add it in enough amounts to the C peptide, it actually crashes the whole thing out of solution. And so uh, we're trying to find ways to actually tease out what's happening a little bit more with iron. Um, but one of those ways I mentioned with albumin, I think is bringing in what other factors may be playing a role in stabilizing um, the system in solution. Okay. So in the interest of time, just one quick, let's say more outreaching question by Annick van Niekerk. Um, and she was asking about uh, other copper dependent conditions such as Wilson's disease. Yes. Um, so actually part of how I got interested in copper is uh, looking at uh, the effects of Wilson's disease. It looks very much like there are certain symptoms like fatty liver that you also see that you see in Wilson's disease, but you also see in um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease uh, as well as uh, hepatitis. And uh, there does seem to be a difference in where what copper is doing in the liver in these diseases, which is part of why we actually are so interested in what's happening to copper in the extracellular space. Because even though uh, phenotypically these um, these copper associated diseases um, may have similar outcomes, at least to the organs. Uh, in terms of whether copper is elevated or deficient, uh, seems to make a difference. So that, that's going into a bit of the work of trying to understand how do you actually measure copper status in this disease? Um, and so you can get more than just copper levels as, as a marker. Thank you very much, Marie. I think we'll, we'll end the discussion at this point. Thanks again for the brilliant talk. And thanks again to all of the speakers um, of today for this, for this really brilliant and amazing symposium. You know, great bioorganic chemistry from a broad variety of topics. Um, and just please bear with me for another minute. I'm going to announce our next symposium at the end of the event. But before I do that, I really want to want to uh, thank my colleagues um, from Without Wiley for working, you know, behind the scenes and all our marketing colleagues. But my special thanks also goes to uh, Charlotte Gers Panther and the team from Your Jog. Charlotte was helping, and the, the team throughout the event, and she was um, answering quite a few questions um, within the chat. Um, and now let's make the announcement of the next symposium. This will be a talk by Jen Heemstra, and this will be the first talk of our Chemistry Europe Voices series. And the talk is going to be on July 28th at 4 p.m. CET or 10 a.m. EST. 
Um, her talk will be about a topic not strictly on chemistry, but about something that we have all faced at some point throughout our career working in this really extremely competitive landscape. And the talk is self-care is not the enemy of performance. Registration is again free. And I will add the link to the participant chat and you will also be able to see the announcement tomorrow on the Chemistry Europe Twitter channel. With this, um, we are at the end of today, today's seminar, and I would like to thank all the speakers again, but especially also our attendees for dialing in from all over the world and for the very, very lively and product productive discussions. Let's raise our glasses, mugs, or whatever feels right at your time of the day. Cheers, and see you at our next Chemist Europe event.